Welcome to a very special audio and visual edition. Hello, hello. I think 25 episodes now of the Hogger History Podcast. Today we're going to talk about Manifest Destiny and what was going on changing in the country between 1810 and 1860 in the United States. This is a lesson for my 8th graders. It's January 2017, and if you are studying history, this is certainly a tip, a tipic and topic, and a tip-top to the tip-top. I almost ran into a Raptors Delight, and it's been 20 seconds. Maybe it's because there's video. Hoo-hoo. Anyway, let's not say hoo-hoo again, and let's move on. The trends in America that were going on during 1810 to 1860 that you're probably going to be studying in high school or middle school, no matter where you're studying American history. I'm Mr. Hogger, and let's get started. So during this period, between 1810 and 1860, this 50-year half century, there was nationalism, a growing sense of pride that was happening in the United States. All the work done by the Founding Fathers to create the Declaration of Independence, to defeat the British against all odds, to fight a war of 1812 that probably didn't need to get fought, but it was still victorious, although you didn't gain anything, so how much did you really win? Let's keep going. There's a lot of sense of identity, in part because of the work of Madison and Jefferson, to create this national unity, this feeling of what it means to be American, and things that we all can share together and call common to this new land and new country that was gaining so much admiration from around the world. Because think about what we had done. We had put in writing, even though it wasn't really in practice yet, that all men were created equal, that life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, Henry Clay, and all of the people who were saying such inspirational, idealistic things, It was on paper, even though it wasn't yet realized in actuality. These notions had never before really been seen by a large nation and were growing like a weed at this time and were gaining ground. Louisiana Purchase had just happened and we're starting to feel this sense of unity and nationhood that was just beginning to bud. Social reforms were happening, intellectual and religious movements spread by literacy and the increasing availability of books and knowledge made the individual person smarter. Think about if you never had any resource except me speaking to you, you'd have to take on account very heavily what I would say. And you wouldn't be likely to question me because you wouldn't have any other information to contact me and to conflict me with. Whereas now, of 25 things that I'll say in this episode or in the 25 episodes of the Hogger History Podcast, free on iTunes right now if you want to go check it out. You can find so much information to contradict me, and you could probably find enough to overturn some of the things that I would say. And that's a wonderful thing, right? You want an abundance of information. And in America, people are just starting to make their own newly formed intellectual and religious movements, almost like a delayed renaissance in America. This was also the beginnings, in a very different way, of economic and business reforms, with the Industrial Revolution taking off in the United States. For the first time, we're sending huge amounts of carbons into the air. We're going to work at large factories and industries during the day instead of our cottage industry making things at home. And this is changing the way that we do things and changing the way of means of production, who owns business, who makes money, separation between wealth and poor, Uh, trying to find rights, children in the workplace in huge numbers, working 10, 12-hour days in deafening conditions and so loud, smoggy, horrible, deep, damp, but also, at the same time, huge opportunities because now you're the leading producer of things like steel and you are just paving the way for all kinds of money and wealth and infrastructure and cities. It's a huge amount of things that are happening in the already established cities in the United States at the time, but you also have further westward expansion. This is what we're talking about today. Manifest destiny, going west, going and taking everything and every piece of land from sea to shining sea. And if you were already there, sorry. And this is kind of an unfortunate side of many aspects and many chapters you'll find in your history book is what we had to do to get here and the things that took place by the people who were here at the time. The term manifest destiny is probably going to come up on an assessment of yours. I don't always ask vocabulary questions, but you get those key concepts that all people today walking the streets will know. It was first coined by John O'Sullivan, not the one who owns the Roseville Auto Mall. I'm pretty sure it's not. I think it's John L. Sullivan. Anyway, 1845, free plug for them. The right of our manifest destiny to overspread and to possess the whole of the continent, which providence has given us for the development of the great experiment of liberty and federal development of self-government and trusted to us. It is right, such true to the air, space of air and the earth suitable for the full expansion of its principle and growth. Uh, short version. Yo, this is ours. Everything is ours in this country, and we're going to take it. So it's quite a, a statement that we're going to go all the way from sea to signing sea, from peanuts poster to never give up towel on the wall. The Pony Express is founded in this time, in 1860, and delivers news between St. Louis, Missouri, and San Francisco, California in just 10 days. And so now we can spread information. 
So unlike when Andrew Jackson led us into the Battle of New Orleans and slaughtered 2,000 people in a huge victory for his career, which ultimately launched him to the presidency, uh, although the treaty had already been signed and the war was over, Mr. Jackson, he didn't know that because the information wasn't getting there in time. So the Pony Express starts during this time. You also have overland immigration to the West, where a quarter of a million people made the trek westward. Thousands of rugged miles in terrain where many would die along the way of disease, succumb to nature, or Jedediah Springfield, I'm thinking of The Simpsons, Jedediah Smith getting his ear swiped off by a bear and having his friends stitch it back on with cloth. Hmm. I'm glad mine is all attached. Uh, Overland Trail to the Oregon Trail. A lot of us remember the video games from my era, but a lot of the kids know it too. They've relaunched and re-released a lot of these things. There are many trails west, the Santa Fe, Santa Fe Trail, the Oregon Trail, the Spanish Trail depending on your teacher and instructor, you want to take a look at those. It's easy to see on a map and easy to grasp um, with visuals. It's a lot easier to kind of see the tracks through the Great Plains, through the middle of the country, over and fording many rivers, and a lot of people traveling up to Washington Territory, the Great da even the Great Basin, uh, the Mormon settling in the Utah area with Brigham Young, and New Mexico Territory getting contrasted as well, and many people migrating down to Mexico. So it was all about what you were looking for, the climate, the weather, the opportunities, the family. Uh, what, what were your driving factors? And those were often the motivations that would push you in different ways. The Donner Party was one party that got pushed into some extreme ways. And I think there may be some family lineage in my heritage. And I think there's a reason why we haven't looked it up. April 1846 to 1847, Margaret, Patrick, perhaps my great, great, great grandson thinks, the Breens, James Reed and his wife. There were 83 members. Only 45 made it to California, and some of them got hungry. And let's just leave it at that. The Oregon dispute happened in the mid-1840s because of Oregon fever. The promise of free land, if you could get there, was a huge, huge motivator. You had to settle the op occupation to really own the territory, right? So you wanted to encourage people to go out there. There was a joint occupation there for a little while between the U.S. and the British. That ended in 1846. The Mexican War takes place 1846 to 1848. And the Mexican recognition of the Rio Grande River as the official border of the Texas-United States line, well, that was going to be contested. The U.S. would forgive American citizens' claims against the Mexican government, and the United States would purchase New Mexico for $5 million in 1845, and that was the Slidell mission. The Wilmot Proviso, another key term and key vocabulary phrase that you'll see, provided uh, territory would be given as an express or fundamental condition, uh, to acquire the Republic of Mexico by the United States and by virtue of any treaty which might be negotiated between them and to use executive of the monies by Congressman David Wilmot. He was trying to set this up and trying to establish some relationship between the United States and Mexico, but it would end up in the Mexican War. And we fight a few wars during this time, and there was a lot of different kinds of feelings than we know today. Anti-Catholic sentiment was happening at this time. Um... General Zachary Taylor at Palo Alto is something in high school you'll probably go over a little bit more. The bombardment of Veracruz, the Battle of Buena Vista, all of these things we could go into detail with over hours, and we always do a simplified review in this podcast. But one of the things that you're definitely going to want to know is the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, 1848. There was an American negotiator named Nicholas Trist, and the treaty was basically forced on Mexico. Okay? Mexico gave up claims to Texas above the Rio Grande River. And you could say Rio Grande if you want. I'm not going to be upset with you, but Rio Grande, of course. Mexico give the United States California and New Mexico. So hello. Uh, welcome to the Union, California. And the United States gave Mexico $15 million and agreed to pay the claims of American citizens against Mexico. The results of the war, what were they? 17 months of fighting cost $100 million and 13000 more than that in American lives, a lot of them dying of disease. Remember, still a very brutal battlefield. If you get winged, if you get sick, if you're out in the field and you're bleeding, you might and probably will not make it. New territories brought in the United States, and that forced the explosive issue of slavery. Remember, always trying to bring in a free state and a slave state, balance the union, preserve the union. It brought in a million square miles of land, including Texas, and these new territories did upset the balance between North and South. So we create an opportunity here for more debate and more disagreement over slavery, more unresolved issues, right? But also some new opportunities. There's new soil, free speech, free labor, 
And there's a lot of opportunities going on in the West, which forces even more people out by the time we get to 1848 and the presidential election between Zachary Taylor and Lewis Cass, Lewis Cass, the Democrat. Mexico cedes more land, gives up more pieces of Texas. We got gold at Sutter's Mill in 1848. Look, the West is on fire at this point. And the East is still growing. Industries are expanding. The United States is undergoing its like teenage years. <laughs> it's starting to really develop. And a lot of excitement goes west. Although we know now, especially us that live in California, what a bust it was for two-thirds or more of the people who came out expecting to find gold, riches, wealth, and opportunity when the word had already passed and most of the gold had already been harvested. But digging in gold brought a lot of opportunity for new views and developments of California cities. By 1860, almost 300,000 people had traveled the Oregon and California trails to find their own territory, pick up an axe, a shovel, or a pan, and try to find some gold. Young America starts traveling in big numbers. There are raids into Latin America, and there is really just an upstart of all kinds of travelers headed to the West. And that's a little bit of what Manifest Destiny is. In the big picture, when we talk about things to remember, a lot of that American never give up attitude was going on. Uh, I want land. We won't stop until we get there and we'll populate this whole nation and gain more land. This is the hugest time for expansion of land in United States history since that Louisiana purchase with just cents an acre that Thomas Jefferson so magnificently negotiated with Napoleon when he was looking to raise money for his numerous wars. Manifest Destiny, it felt like it was a God-given mission by many at the time, that this was all right to take this opportunity in this land. And right now, I'm going to take this opportunity to thank you for listening. Remember, you can subscribe to the Hogger History Podcast for more topics. If we get more subscribers, we'll have more video versions of this. Otherwise, go to hoggerhistory.podbean.com or search Hogger History Podcast on YouTube. Subscribe for free and on iTunes and uh, pick up the other 24 episodes for 6th, 7th, and 8th grade middle schoolers. Uh, click the subscribe link. I think it's over here. You'll tell me, right? I don't know. All right. Go ahead and contradict me in the comments and we'll talk later. Look, uh, history is a conversation written by the winners, many nuances and many opinions. Whether you're right or wrong depends on the kind of information and the evidence that you cite. And I'm always open for discussion. So we'll talk to you later. This is Mr. Hogger saying uh, class is over. Turn in your chairs. Turn in your chairs. Yeah, I'm pushing your homework and we'll see you next time.